MIT grad in chemical engineering, got a bachelor's and master's, and somewhere along the line, um, I also got an MBA from the Sloan School. Um, I started work in industry in the classic way that MIT grads have of joining their professor's startup company. And it was a little company that moved after it got a little bigger into Lexington. And that was Amicon up on Hartwell Avenue. Um, and then after a few more hops around the engineering profession, in 1986, I joined MIT's Technology Licensing Office, which is the patent and licensing office of MIT, originally uh, just as an individual contributor, and eventually, on about 92, became director. Uh, so I was there for 30 years and retired about four years ago. So what I, this lecture is about is about how universities use patents. Dick told you what a patent was last week, and here's why universities rather than companies use it and why this aspect of technology transfer and economic development um, was an obscure little profession in the mid 80s. Uh, but nowadays, all over the world, people are trying to replicate what the major US universities are doing in terms of using patents, intellectual property, to encourage early investment in the inventions arising out of research. And I'll explain why. But it has become uh, it has become one of the most critical aspects in the world. I must have been visited by people from I don't know at least fifty different countries saying what was the magic sauce that made Kendall Square, and I've visited probably two dozen companies trying to explain to them that tech transfer is not about the money, but does require a well-supported, intense research mission in the country. OK, so I'm going to push through this and show you what we do. If anyone wants to ask a question that relates to this, but also maybe to patents, maybe an, I can answer it. And if I can't, uh, Dick certainly can. But I do want to encourage you to stop and ask questions whenever you want. OK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Husbands are useful. <laughs> Excuse me, make a good t shirt. Husbands are useful. Okay. Go back. Okay. So the profession itself has been called technology transfer, that is, transfer of technology out of research universities and into true innovation, that is, pro products in the real world. However, if you think about it, there's lots of forms of technology transfer from academia to industry. And perhaps the most important is the graduating student at the state of the art who are bringing the results of the university's research into the jobs they take. And Bob Brown, who is currently president of Boston University, but he used to be provost at MIT, and he used to say about technology transfer that technology transfers best in objects that wear shoes. <laughs> <laughs> But moving on. Next, Don. Thank you. The formal definition, and what I'm going to be talking about with respect to US, well, worldwide universities now, is the purposeful transfer of the results of inventions coming out of fundamental research into the economy by protecting the intellectual property mostly patents, but also software. And then out-licensing the patents to 
companies. Now, as you may recall from Dick's lecture last uh, week, patents don't allow you to do something. They allow you to exclude others from doing it. Next slide. So before we go on, let me just get some vocabulary. Patents, you all know from last week, a grant by the government to exclude others from practicing your invention. Now, you, when I use the word university, I'm taking a shortcut. It's fundamental research organizations, which can include research hospitals like the Brigham or Mass General or Beth Israel and other nonprofit research institutions like the Wistar Institute. Okay, so that's when I say university, I mean that whole list of things. When I say license, a license is a grant that you give to allow someone else to use your intellectual property. And two words that I won't use much here but always confused me for ages, a licensor, like an employer, is the owner of the patent or the other intellectual property. A licensee, like an employee, is the entity granted the license by the licensor. Next slide. An exclusive licensee is when the patent owner grants only one license. I'm going to give you a license so that the licensee has a monopoly to use the invention. An exclusive license will also allow the licensee to sue others using the invention, usually needs some help from the uh, owner. Yes? Does that mean a licensor cannot use it? That's an excellent question. Usually an exclusive license means the licensor cannot use it. But in the case of universities and other research institutions, and sometimes in the case of companies, we grant an exclusive license for commercial use to the licensee, but reserve the right to use for research and education within the university and for other nonprofits. So you really, that's a little glitch, but it's an important one. A non-exclusive license says, I give you a license, so I won't sue you if you use the patent, but I can give it to anybody else I want, and you can't keep the competition out. So in this case, a non-exclusive license is really just a permission to use, for which one pays. Next. Uh, can I ask you, sure. why would you select one of the other, in other words, Okay, well, I'll tell you why we do, okay? Uh, a simple answer for these is when the patent, the invention, is self-obviously useful and everybody wants it. An exclusive license is often, as we'll explain, a kind of a bribe to get you to invest and try to make it real. Okay, and I'll, it's an important part of this uh, process. Next. Nope, wrong direction. Oh, oh, well, it is the right direction. I exclude, I uh, did it twice. Next, to remind you what we're talking about. Okay, so given your question, why, I'll come to you in one second, why if a research university's mission is to discover and disseminate knowledge, why would they want to restrict the use of the patent? Why would you want to exclude others? And the answer, which I briefly alluded to, but will come in more detail in a minute, is so that we can get industry to develop into public use. Your question? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, previous slide. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> a, lot of the, the, a lot of the transfer is of applied research. Even from universities, out of engineering departments? And well, it's, a, there's, there's, yes, I'm calling it fundamental research. Some of it may be fairly obvious from the science, 
Most isn't. I mean, it's applied in the sense that you're trying to figure it out something that's important to get it applied. But it's usually new knowledge, or you don't really get to do interesting publications in major universities. Well, you, you take, take an example. If you have devices, and, and <clears throat> the AA department at MIT would certainly be inventing devices. Those could very easily. Yeah, be, but, but, those but aren't they are inventing. They're yeah. not necessarily fundamental. Yeah. That's true. It, but under, that's true, and I perhaps have exaggerated that aspect of it. Uh, Dick, did you yeah, have well, a question? The thing I was going to say is the thing, what, what you just said is something that's patentable. Right. It's got to be new. To, to you, that might, that might be obvious, even. We'll talk about that later. Well, second. we'll do another time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Onward we go. Okay. Next. Here's the issue, and this is really the issue of the whole talk. Universities do research, maybe applied, maybe basic. And out of it comes something that potentially could be protected with a patent, an invention. That invention is a long way from a product. You know, maybe you have found a spike on a coronavirus that is what makes it infective, well, it's a long way from a drug that will block that spike in the body. Okay, so the expensive part is that third step, the development, to get from a paper in Science Magazine to a product on the shelf. And that's what we're trying to incentivize, because only if that third step is done do we get new products and medicines, new technology for manufacture, and last, new companies. But we'll come into why that's such an important part of the equation when we're talking about university research inventions. Next. Yeah. The, I call university inventions embryonic they might develop into a product. Another way of saying it is that half-baked would be a compliment because neither the technical feasibility of practical product development nor the fact that would anyone want it. And we've all got stories in applied research developments where the market was, people didn't believe it'd be much of a market. And that can range from Carlson and his photocopy machine that became Xerox. And the contemplation was, how many thousand would the world need? To Ken Olson saying, why would you need a home computer? People can balance their checkbooks by themselves. And in many cases, and in the pharma area, the biotech industry, it's going to take perhaps hundreds of millions to find out it doesn't work. So this is a risky, depending on what it is. If it's a piece of software, it's not so risky. If, but the, whether it will be replaced by something else is the risk. So it's expensive and it's risky. Next. OK, you're going to have to see, click through this one. So the idea was to use intellectual property as an incentive to incentivize the first mover. If you'll take this risky bet that may cost you tens or hundreds of millions and it works, the, the guy who would like to be second, thank you for showing the way, now it'll only cost me five million instead of 500 million, will be blocked by the patent. So it's the using intellectual property as a protection to incentivize somebody to take the risk of development. OK, next. So the university grants the company an exclusive license. The company has to commit in the license agreement to investment and development by various achievements called diligence milestones. In some cases, you can, if it's relatively early, you can say something like you'll have a prototype, a working prototype within 18 months. If it's something where you don't know whether that gene to correct the brain disease can be delivered to the brain, 
we might have to use surrogate milestones, like how much money can you raise to show us that you've got enough people working on it to do it. But given that they commit to development, then if the development succeeds, the company is protected from competitors. And the for a while is because patents expire, of course. And as Dick explained last week, a patent's really a bargain with the government. I, the inventor, will sh show you how to do it, including the cinnamon in the magic sauce. And I'll write it down and I'll let others read it. If, in return, I can sue anybody who tries to do it for the length of the patent. That's really what a patent's about. It's in return for showing how to do it so that science can build on your invention we will give you that legal protection. Okay. If you're, if you're going to do serious development, the chances of generating new patents seem to be very high. It is indeed very high. Who is going to have those patents? In the case of the way American universities do it, the company owns it. So we understand that our patent may get replaced, but it's a head start. Or maybe, our patent will be very important for its life. But then the company has its own patents that were filed later and give them another 20 years. And that's exceptionally important in some fields where the life cycle of development uh, and the life cycle of patents aren't very attractive. I mean, yes? In the case of universities, maybe hospitals and places like that, generally, they got a grant from the government yes. to do this work. And Does the government give up all ownership? Next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will talk about that. Actually, it's not the next slide. It's about three slides from now. Yes. Okay. So, as we said, it's particularly important for those that have long life cycles. Uh, pharmaceuticals in particular, I don't know if any of you read the newspaper the last two days, but trying to explain to our dear president that a vaccine is not going to be ready in three months. <laughs> With clinical, I, don't, I don't know if you read it, but there was a meeting. Uh, okay, next. But we're not only talking about pharmaceuticals. Next, uh, okay. Superconductors liquid metal batteries, you name it, anything that's going to take a long period of time, not six months to get the software out. Public key encryption is a particularly interesting one. Uh, RSA, Revest, Shamir Adelson, uh, that was an MIT invention, and it was delayed issuing. It was done, fully developed for 18 of the 20 years or so of the patent because the NSA didn't want it out in the real world because other nasty guys might have it. The fact that they already had it didn't seem to, not only had it, but was using it and Silverman and everybody else. But that's another story. That's why we never got much money out of RSA in terms of royalties. Uh, next. OK, so how does it work? The researcher identifies an invention. They report it to the tech transfer office. Then the tech transfer office, no, not MIT, is the technology licensing office, tries to read a crystal ball. Is it patentable first? There's two questions. Is it patentable, and would anyone want it if it worked? Uh, so is it patentable, you can have, get a halfway decent uh, idea that it's not patentable anyway by reading the literature and looking for prior art as uh, Dick covered. Will it be interesting and get someone to invest in it? We just talked about Xeroxes and, and uh, home computers. Who knows? So the idea is can you envision how important it would be? What is the current state of the art? How much better is this than what's on the market? And, and worst of all, which nobody predicts very well, how hard will it be to scale up to manufacture? Okay, so we file a patent, and at that point, 
uh, get the company to license the patents who will develop the technology into products. Next. How do you make companies aware of, of a patent or what's available? Well, you can list all you want on websites. And lots of universities spend lots of time listing, quote, non-confidential uh, descriptions and employ lots of st grad students writing them, and nothing ever happens. <laughs> it basically comes about from customers finding themselves or most very frequently the scientists finding each other both from the company and whatever. But that's the bit, one of the biggest limiting resistances in the whole game. Because we didn't list anything for decades. And then we got nasty into listing, and nothing happened. OK. Uh, so the license agreement, for those who aren't familiar with it, will go very quickly. It basically says, here's an agreement. You have permission to use often exclusive, and we'll talk about why, the company commits to development, and the company pays license fees and royalties on sales to the university. Next. The government's role. I told you I'd get it through. OK. The majority of, federal, of fundamental research, and even a lot of applied research, is sponsored by the federal government. The numbers vary depending on what else you count, but it's more than half. And the amount sponsored by industry is very low. Uh, it averages about 7% of research in American universities. Um, MIT, it's closer to 20 odd percent. OK. So originally, the federal government owned the patents arising from the research it sponsored, an answer to you. And what happened? Not very much is the answer. Lots of patents in dusty file drawers in the government. Yeah. Uh, in addition, they, uh, they basically would license anybody. That is part of the problem, that they, they would license anybody. And because the easiest way to stay out of trouble is to not do anything important. Well, it's also the question of, uh, of perceived favoritism. Exactly. That's what I mean. You'd get in trouble. Yeah. All right. So there were very few licenses granted and very little effect on the economy. So in 1980, next slide. Uh, uh, kick down it, Don. Thanks. A law was passed. Tick all the way down. Uh, it, that, yeah, thanks. Uh, the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, for those of you who recall, late 70s, early 80s, America was afraid that Japan was going to eat its lunch economically. Now it's China, of course. Um, and so. Two senators got together in a bipartisan way that could never happen nowadays. Uh, Birch Bayh, very liberal Democrat, and Bayh-Dole, very conservative Republican, got together for the Bayh-Dole Act. And um, The Economist, about 10 years ago, said that this was one of the most important pieces of legislation that the United States had done in the last decades. What did it do? It said to the universities, you can own the patents, not us, if you will file the patent. If you don't file the patent, it comes back to us. And you can grant licenses. Now, the most important part of that when you're talking about early stage technology is that you're doing it at the local level. Because who knows the most about this technology? The inventors. And if it's very early and you can get the faculty involved, and sometimes even the grad students and postdocs will go to work with, at the company because they know all the know-how, uh, you're really making a major change. Next. Oh, so they allowed exclusive licenses. That took a while. When the law was first passed, they didn't quite, but eventually they did. Next. 
and they allowed the universities to take royalties, that is to be paid for the patents. They also said that a fraction of the royalties that were received would be shared with the inventors. Now, it didn't say which fraction, and end of story, mostly nowadays it's between a, qu a quarter and a third. Those of you who've worked in industry and have patents, how many? Yeah. What'd you get for it? One dollar. In your case, one dollar? Zero dollars, $3,000 per patent. Well, that's good. That's doing very, very well. That, but that's in later Remember days. The amount of time you put into it. Yeah, right. not paid time. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, yeah, well, that's late. Nowadays, if you, in the old days, at least what I got, I think, was a pat on the back, and you got a dollar. That was inflation. OK, uh, when, I, when he had a pat. Um, however, nowadays, we've made a few millionaires among our faculty this way. The university doesn't make all that much money all the time, but sometimes it does. OK. Next. And this, I'll talk about money to the universities because that's more legend than fact. But there's a lot of indirect financial benefits because if you know what you're doing with patents, it's more likely that industry will work with you in sponsoring research. We've had some big winners who have then gone and endowed some chairs. But most importantly, and we'll talk about it more of it later, economic development locally. And those of you, and I guess most of you are old enough to remember what uh, Kendall Square looked like in 1960 when I came to college here, uh, and what it looks like now. And a lot of it came from this process. Next. OK. Because people think this is a business, and I've spent 30 years trying to convince people it's not. Uh, the, I've had, in fact, after I retired, I had one of the largest recipients of federal funding research in the country call me up and say, you know, federal funding is getting tighter. We really need to gin up our tech transfer to take the place, the money, the royalties to replace the federal funding of research. Would you come out and tell us how to do it? And it was a very interesting phone call because I said to them, I don't know how to do that. And I will give you some numbers. Needless to say, I didn't get the job. Some poor guy or woman has it. But OK, because the statistics show that unless you get lucky, it is not going to be a substantial source of, re of revenue for the university. Now, so if you want to set up a tech transfer office, say, in another country, don't count on it supporting your university or even supporting itself for the first 10 years. Next. OK, here's some statistics of something I did in 2012. I did it a few years later again, but can't find the data. Uh, but looks the same. In any given year, so this was fiscal year 2012, 5,000 US patents issued to US universities. Now, why only US? They had lots more, but if you want to count the number of inventions that are patented, let's work with the US patent. Because if the same invention was patented, in England and South Africa and Brazil and Japan and Korea. That shouldn't count. It's six patents. OK. So over 5,000 and thousands of, uh, there were over 6,000 agreements that had some money connected with them, either as licenses or options. New agreements signed that year, over 6,000. In the drawer, there were 40,000 active license agreements. The patents hadn't expired. Now, we're talking about 200 universities and research hospitals. And that year alone, they started 700 companies. Well, this looks pretty successful. Next. The total amount of money that came in that year in licensing revenue, 
fees, if they had a little equity in the startup companies, cash in of equity. Looks like a lot of money. Nowadays, it's probably a little higher. So let's say $3 billion. But then if you took the research base, most of it federal, it's 4% gross return. That's not going to replace federal funding. Not only is it not, and remember that's gross, after you take out about a third that go to the inventors and other expenses, it's not a money-making business. So it is gravy, isn't it? It, it is gravy, right. It, gravy is different. If what you want is gravy, that's fine. Start stirring. But if you want it to support your organization, it ain't going to do it. And not only that, boys and girls, but this is the good news. Next. Because in any given year that you study, about half of the total licensing income, the total $3 billion, came from about a dozen universities. And they're different universities each time. They may be on the list for a few years. Because the vast majority, when you got a big one, a university earning lots of money, is that they have one big blockbuster that's bringing in $100 million a year or more. Or they monetize that stream. And you read in the newspaper that Mass General got $500 million from licensing. But the problem is, it happens. And then the patents expire. And the head of the tech transfer office goes from being a hero to a bum in six months. <laughs> so really, if you look at the statistics, and you guys are all technical, uh, it's a lottery if you want to win big. If you want to do good things, if you enjoy gravy and you do useful other stuff for the sake of the society, fine. But if you think it's going to make you lots of money, probably easier to buy lottery tickets. OK, next. <laughs> but the, royal, the societal impact is very great. And if you'll just click all the way down that. At the time I was looking at it, there were 7,000 new companies formed licenses under the Bayh-Dole Act. Estimated about half a million jobs, direct jobs, working on licensed products. And as any economist will know, you have to multiply by three or four for the effect on the economy. <laughs> Significant tax returns to the government, and most importantly, well, second most importantly, the important products that get developed. And next. Whoops. Let's keep going. A significant number of new startups, Google and Stanford, keep going, Todd. Uh, and these clusters that form around major research universities. We've got the biggest biotech cluster in the world now uh, in Cambridge. And the majority of new biotech companies spin directly out of universities. And lots of other economic development. Next. OK, so what happened in MIT? Certain of the research, about a dozen of the re major research universities in the US, starting in about 1960, had something called institutional patent agreements. MIT, Stanford, a few others, Carnegie uh, Mellon etc. And they were essentially identical to the Bayh-Dole Act, almost word for word from the viewpoint of the universities. But MIT was lagging way behind. And so in 86, it got reorganized from a, basically a patent office to a technology licensing office with people with strong technical backgrounds and business experience. And we went from about eight licenses a year and about two million a year to close to 100 licenses uh, and options and income in the 40 million a year, which still isn't much if you look at MIT with a billion and a half 
almost a billion and a half of research funding. And by the way, that's two billion if you count Lincoln Labs, because MIT manages Lincoln Labs patents. And now they've been averaging about two dozen startups for each, per year over the past 20 years. Next. Some you may recognize. I just put a few up. We're talking about hundreds. But you know Akamai if you're in the storage business. Cubis Pharmaceutical became, started as two professors. And as you may or may not recall, it had offices in Lexington and sold itself for $8 billion to Merck. Alnylam has been developing gene therapy for 22 years, got the first product on the market at year 20. Uh, you've heard of Editas and CRISPR and various others. I just sort of picked old ones and new ones and ones you may have heard the names of. Each of these were a professor in his lab or her lab uh, coming across in what they thought was an invention, coming to the TLO and saying this could be important, and then finding ways to commercialize it. In all of why startups, and I'll talk about that in a minute, OK? Why do we put such an emphasis on startups, and we don't talk about the licenses that went directly to Merck as opposed to a buying cubist? Uh, the reason is we try to license to existing companies, and they say, no thanks. It's too early. I don't have the specialized manpower. It's going to take too much money. And if you're in a major industry, the vice president who says yes is hurting his bottom line during the development and will have another job or no job by the time the product comes on the market. So who would be silly enough to say yes? Um, so basically, the large companies have said, no, thanks. Your stuff's too early. Next. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh, but, they, but they have an alternative strategy that they, um, that they use, especially with MIT and to some extent Harvard. And that is that they put their scientists in groups at the university and they make investments that give them, uh, give them insight. Far fewer than they used to. Okay. Why fewer than they used to? Because that thing is a long-term investment. Mm -hmm. And the big companies are not making long-term investments. In many cases, they've laid off a good fraction of the people doing earlier stage research. So they're doing far less of that. They have a different strategy now. And we'll come to it. That basically, they say, you know, we may even sponsor some research and see what's going on, but no thanks. Even then, they don't want the license when they want to have first rights. They may take it if it's free, a non-exclusive license, but if they have to pay anything, they don't want it because they know they won't work on it yet. And so what's happened is that the startup companies have become a necessary bridge to the large companies because, and we know what the ultimate cause of that is, of course, is that the stock market has gone from investment to short-term speculation. So that bonuses for, for executives are for what happens next year, not what's the hot product you get on the market 10 years from now. You don't get rewarded for that. In fact, you might not have the job by the time it comes. So what the startup companies have basically been filling the gaps uh, because they are able to attract high-risk capital because, again, venture capital people are willing to pay, play lotteries because when they win, they win very big. Uh, you know, Cubist really only had a couple of products. But Merck was willing to pay $8 billion from them. Now, the, the venture guys who invested in them early on were feeling pretty good at the end, if they kept investing. Uh, OK, so that the startup company reduced the risk of development to the big company. 
They shortened the time to market a lot so that the vice president deciding to buy it can actually see the products. And they also, the mergers with the big companies have become a very important exit strategy for the investors in the startups. They don't have to wait till the IPO window is open. And so they, uh, so next. Okay, so there's a sort of chain of value and this we'll do one at a time. Next, next. This is where it all starts. All this economic development, all these new drugs, the, ver the vast variety of really new non-Me Too drugs in the market came from a university license. They may, the patent may not still be alive, but they got started that way. So if the government cuts this back, which they have been doing, you can, I'll leave it to you to predict the results. Next. So the university does the research and presumably gets an invention. Next. The technology licensing office files the patent. Next. We start up a company. We give a license to the startup. Next. The venture investors fund the startup. Usually starts with angel investors, although not in the true biotech area, because the problem with the amount of money you can get from an angel investor isn't going to be enough to move it very far. And by the time they get into B round and C round and D round and E round, the original investors are diluted down to I call it homeopathic proportions. <laughs> okay, next. So the startup company develops the product using that high-risk capital. And this is the point at which, next, they exit. The big company acquires the product line. They have the marketing. In the case of uh, drugs, they have the clinical trial, money, and capability. So this becomes a very important chain of value. But if you don't start it, it doesn't get to the bottom. And this is what the universities keep trying to tell the government. OK, next. MIT and Stanford, probably the two of us together, my uh, the director of Stanford's office also retired a couple of years ago. And she and I often benchmarked against each other. So there's very similar characteristics. One is you got to do a lot of research. Uh, you got to know what you're doing in IP and in tech transfer. And at both MIT and at Stanford, they understand that the tech transfer office, although it may make a little money, it's nice money to have, good gravy, well salted. Uh, it's not primarily a profit center. And uh, when a new president came into MIT, when Susan Hockfield came in, I was supposed to give a talk to her. And I don't know why I did it, but I titled it Impact Not Income is what we're about. And at the time, we were making close to 100 million. Uh, but wanted to explain, it ain't going to stay this way. We have one of those blockbusters, and isn't that nice? But the fact that the administration at MIT understands that it's not about the income, but about the impact on the students, the faculty, and the community. Next. The other thing that makes it, click all the way down on this one, Don, thanks. The other thing that makes it easy is when we throw the baby out in the snow, you know, these very embryonic inventions with the teeny company, we're in an environment which the universities here, Harvard and MIT and the hospitals, helped create a highly entrepreneurial geographic environment. You can't do the same thing in Kansas City yet. It will take 25 years of development if they start investing now. Um, I don't know whether all of you know it, but the, as far as I know, the first technology-based, and by technology, I mean all technologies, based venture capital firm 
at least in the United States, American research and development was formed by Dorian from Harvard and Compton, who was president of MIT at the time. And their first investment was a huge, this is late 60s, I guess, 70s, early 70s, early 70s, it was $75,000 in a guy from MIT's research laboratory of electronics named Kennels. And he founded Digital Equipment Corporation, and that was history. And you can trace the cluster, it didn't stay in Cambridge, it went out to the suburbs, but you can cha cha trace the early computer cluster uh, to the small computer cluster in Massachusetts to that. Okay, so it's a lot easier in Cambridge nowadays to start a company than it is a, a startup technology-based company than it is in most places in the world. Um, one of the things, yes, we've got companies, venture capitalists, angel investors, accountants, real estate people who are willing to take a chance on blue sky electronics that might not last six months but might become Akamai. Uh, and so again, it's much easier. It's, we've helped create a much warmer environment for it. The other thing is, is I've gone around the world, yes, risk capital is scarce, but what's scarcer, both in most places in the United States and certainly around the world, is CEOs of small science-based startups. People who know how to raise the money and also manage science towards products. What happens when you get a cluster is that the cluster feeds itself. If I started a biotech company tomorrow, where would I get a CEO? Well, she's probably number three in the last biotech company that gets started. We are educating and developing our own resources. Next. A lot of universities have started developing what's called entrepreneur, internal entrepreneurial ecosystems with MIT. Again, click through uh, the Deshpande Center, which gives small, no, next, small grants to uh, projects, professors and grad students who um, look like another year of research will actually be able to make this licensable. And they not only give them money, but they pair them with mentors for their projects who have a sense of the business that they're interested in. MIT was among the first, maybe the first, of the student business plan contests. We have something now where sandbox student mentoring, and I mentor in this thing, any student with an idea will be given a small amount of cash to run around and talk to their cust potential customers and then engage in one-on-one -on -one mentoring over months as we help them get uh, their ideas together. The idea of the sandbox one, which goes everywhere from freshmen to just about to graduate PhDs is not that it's going to get a whole lot more companies off the ground, but that it's going to educate our students while they're studying chemistry or whatever uh, as to the issues involved in starting a company under the idea that they might do it someday or they might do it now. I'm mentoring currently a student who is getting a lot of traction from, of all things, the, he started a company, support from the major um, gas and oil companies because he's got a new process and, and worked very hard at figuring out how to, it would be used to convert the sulfur and smokestack gases uh, to extract hydrogen and eliminate the sulfur. So he's got both sulfur elimination from smokestacks coupled 
with production, economic production of hydrogen. And that one looks like it's going to be real, so hang on to your hats. Uh, you never know. Some of them are ridiculous, but we teach them how to decide for themselves that it's not going to fly. And many, many, many others. There's probably, I could triple that. Yes, the big companies will always be here, but it's very evident that real innovation is probably going to happen from individuals with visions. Next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Yes, Dick. Um, going back to your licensing way back at the beginning here, do you ever give licenses today into fields? Yes. This is called field of use licensing, so that you have a technology that might be useful for many things. It could, it's easier for me to uh, do the biotech because I'm more familiar with it. But let's say you have a gene transfer invention that could be used for epilepsy. It could be used, so that would be things that go into the brain. It could be used for genetic diseases of the kidney, et cetera, et cetera. So you can give a license, an exclusive license in, say, the neuro, uh, neurology field and another license in the, um, in the kidney area. Yes, we do do that. It's kind of a pain because you have to make sure that you know how to draw the lines. We used to know what we were doing and really screwed up. You know, if you did pharmaceuticals and medical devices and then what happens if you've got a new medical device to, uh, to deliver a pharmaceutical? Yeah, it's a mess. Uh, so, yes, we do do field abuse licenses. It's fairly common. Yes, sir. I, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin. And oh, we they're among the favorite. big winners. Yeah. We knew what the Steenbach process was. <coughs> right, was. and you knew what vitamin D was. Yes, and what, yeah, yeah. 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 And right. what, what Wisconsin has done is they really made a business out of it in two different ways. One, they took a lot of the money and bought land when land was cheap a long time ago. But the other thing they do is they have invested in purposely uh, working on continuous improvements and new methods related to the vitamin D so that they continue to have patents in the area when the old ones expired. Plus, in the days when you could make a patent last a lot longer. Nowadays, as we discussed yesterday, uh, last week, patents expire 20 years after you file the first invention, uh, uh, first either uh, First patent application. So if you screw around and you drop that one and file a continuation, which is ways that people went on for decades keeping their patents alive, uh, it won't work anymore. It expires in year 20. Uh, the other thing they do is they follow that money back in so that they're supporting research. Your... Right, they are indeed. And in fact, the law, the My Doll Act says the money you earn that doesn't go to the inventors has to be plowed back into research and education. That's required in the law if it's federally so funded. No, nah, just goes into everything they do is research and education. We are not in the selling products business. No, it won't buy the president's yacht. No, no. I mean, <laughs> or raise his salary yeah. or anything we like that. Yeah, and met, yeah, Wisconsin makes a lot of money from that. Yes. A question here. This is kind of his, <clears throat> history related. You mentioned about World War II. Yeah. I saw. I think it's either a dozen. It's either a twelve volume or twenty-four volume of the electronic systems of oh, yes. the electronic engineering at Raytheon many, many years ago. Yeah. And to me, it was like I was wondering how many patents if that. Uh, 
uh, volume you know, work that came out of that work because you guys established the, basically the electronic engineering business. Well, you said Raytheon, though. Well, Raytheon had the, uh, I saw her at the Raytheon library. Oh, I see. But these what were. What is the name of that? Those volumes. I, I Compendium. Have I don't that's, know. The, MIT, the, that's the MIT Radiation Lab series. That's the Rad Lab series. The Rad, the Rad, the Rad, the Rad Lab. MIT yeah. was not actively filing patents at that time. One or two, mm -hmm. but very, very few. The the one of the earliest ones that went anywhere was. Uh, J, uh, magnetic core memory, oh, oh, uh, J, Forrester. J Forrester, right. yeah. That was a big one, Another, and that was in the probably early 60s. Not during the Second World War, I don't think there was very much well, at this all. Was, this was published in that, around 1948. Yeah, well, yeah, so there wouldn't have been many patents filed yet. The end of the Rad Lab, they were closing down the Rad Lab, turning it into RLE, but, yeah. but there was a closeout. Yep. Right. But you must publish the results of all uh, we just did in mm -hmm. the previous four years. Yeah. Yeah, Boy, some, of those, some of those books, there's one on microwave theory. Yes, I specialized in microwaves so, yeah. at that yeah. time. And boy, that was marvelous. I like they, that. they brought all the radar people from Europe into MIT's uh, radiation lab, yeah. and they developed the, the radar techniques that were then used on airplanes and submarines in real time during the war. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what I was, because that's when I was, because yeah. I went to Lowell Tech, and it, that was started by the MIT professor. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, right. I, uh, <laughs> I remember reading that volume. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's what that means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and microwaves. You could yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, go, go back even a little farther in history uh, and, and understanding who's going to reap the benefits of technology and, and development and transfer. Ernest Rutherford, which Around, he was around 1900, how many you know? He was around 1900, he was at the University of England, and he was trying to measure radiation decay. He was having a lot of trouble doing it. And he had a grad student working on it. And they, and they worked out, made a gun to shoot alpha particles. Okay. And now they shot them against a phosphorescent screen, which would glow up. Mm -hmm. And they would count them, whatever. But the, uh, it was, the, the light wasn't bright enough, uh, the phosphorus wasn't bright enough, so they had to do it at night. Now, everybody knows professors don't work after 5 p.m. It's a union rule. <laughs> so he had his graduate student had to come in. So his graduate student is shooting the gun, and his graduate student is the one who sets up the gold leaf to watch it reflect off and see what he can catch on reflection. And lo and behold, he found out that atoms are, are basically vacuums and that the alpha particles shot right through the gold leaf and hit the phosphorescent screen on the back side, not the front side. And he was astounded. Now, Ernest Rutherford was a grand professor, and he won the Nobel Prize for this. His graduate student was Hans Geiger. Mm. Hans Geiger transferred the information to the professor who won the Nobel Prize, but Hans Geiger made the dough. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably figure out what his invention was. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. All the guy kind of besides that, yeah. <laughs> So, so he didn't transfer at all. He got the idea, of, he was the entrepreneur. Right. Right. He got the Nobel Prize, but yeah, Hans Geiger was the entrepreneur. The grad student was the entrepreneur, so yeah. there you go. Well, he had to wait till after World War I before he could go home to Germany and start a business. <laughs> and actually make the Geiger kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, you, uh, have you had an interface with Jonathan Gruber? Jonathan Gruber? Uh, the name sounds familiar. Where is he at? Okay. Jonathan Ruber lives in my name. Yeah. Ruber. Associated with the university. With MIT. And, uh, and wrote the book, Jump Starting America. And that book is taking the uh, concept of research in the university, which is exactly what you're doing. Yep. And, and uh, creating federal funding to uh, cities scattered throughout the country to create clusters 
technology clusters and foster technology growth in what we would call maybe the mid-America size yeah. cities around the country. It's a long process. Yeah. If they if they think they're going to see much progress in five years, the answer is no. And a lot of places have been trying it. Often it ends up as real estate ploys. They, I don't mean in a, in a negative way, but they, uh, they decide that the solution is to build incubators. And as all of you know, if you're trying to make something go faster than from here to here, you've got to work on the limiting resistance, not widen the, the part here. And the problem is that usually space is not the limiting resistance. It's well, early stage venture investors with knowledgeable leaders. But in this case, uh, uh, I was active with the, the old MIT Enterprise Forum. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Still around. Actually, if I want to back up a ways, uh, your uh, MIT, uh, the Inman, uh, Kendall Square, yeah. was the old part that you wanted to tear down and get rid of and replace, was in fact created uh, out of uh, MIT, both in the mid-1800s to make fire hose, and in World War II to support uh, uh, various efforts of World War II effort. And uh, I had the pleasure of running it in 1970s. Hmm. Uh, the, the, uh, so you're replacing your own creation over there. And well, that explains why. There was, do you remember the building on Main Street that had this rubber, I think it was rubber, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. belt that had been running for, what, 120 years or something? Well, uh, I don't know how many of, oh, half this room's got to be MIT, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, one candle square yeah? <laughs> used to be the dock yes. for the ships coming from Malaysia with rubber. I see. That's why you had all these rubber companies. And yeah. they brought the, hmm. you know, the rubber, the rubber grew out of the creation of the fire hose. MIT developed the rubber liner and the way to insert the rubber liner into what was then just a cloth fire hose. Oh my. Wow. And that was the origin of Kendall Square manufacturing <laughs> as I know it. And that's why it was called Boston Woven Hose. Yeah, yeah. And when my first job out of MIT, which I was saying was Amicon, it started, I believe, on the corner of Binney, and I think it was 6th Avenue. And we used to lo lo look at 6th Street. We used to write diagonally across was green rubber. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and that building was the first location for, um, what's the big biotech company? Biogen. Biogen, yeah. Biogen, yeah. because Biogen sublet that property from me. From green rubber. Well, it all was at that time, 1960s, it was Icon Corporation. Oh, yes, I recall, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Icon was originally a spinoff from MIT's uh, motion control uh, electronics effort by another Lexington gentleman who became 
a venture capitalist, and uh, I took that over in 1960. Okay. Uh, that's. Uh, but, uh, and approximately that corner, I guess it's third and Binney, yeah. is yeah. the Kendall Boiler Works. Yeah. And they're preserving that building. And it's quite funny because I took a couple of pictures. There's the Kendall Boiler Works here. And there's Al Nylum, this big, shiny pharmaceutical company, uh, exactly diagonally across Binney. And I, I didn't know where the name, I assumed Kendall Boiler Works was named after Kendall Square, but that's not true. Kendall Square is named after Mr. Kendall, who started the Kendall Boiler Works. <laughs> and the building's still there, and the sign's still on it, and I don't know what they're going to do with it. Well, there's a I want to say, Lena wrote a, an essay for a speech that she gave to the Biotechnology Council about the history of Kendall Square, starting from when she arrived there. <laughs> so this is very interesting. That's your question. I don't know when you arrived at Kendall Square, but I grew Class up Class of 64. Here. So I, I, I grew up around here. And, and around that time, crime was rampant. Oh, yeah. And Kendall Square was such a dump that you had to take the subway to Central Square just to get mugged. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then there was the old F&T diner. And, and Flo, yes. and, and the waitress in the F&T diner. Flo. I thought the F&T diner was the source of an awful lot of advances. That well, he oh, says yeah. he wrote his PhD thesis have over French toast at the yeah, F&T yeah. diner. Uh, I, mean, I used to hang around with John King and, and he yep. was a student of, Jack, of Zacharias. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they figured out almost all their advances mm -hmm. at the F&T diner. Hmm. Well, and they did it in the morning with, or you guys did it in the morning. The, mm -hmm. the leading, this is almost the fundamental patent of the biotechnology uh, industry, which was the one in which you could take a gene, and snip a piece of it, and put it into a bug, and uh, make the bug produce a protein that the bug had never produced before. Basically recombinant engineering, recombinant. Uh, that apparently arose from two professors, one from Stanford and one from UC San, San Francisco, uh, in a bar in Hawaii. <laughs> so, <laughs> let us keep these sacred places important. Yeah. Oh, and I guess the Crick and Watson, the, the uh, understanding what DNA was was the Eagle Bar in Cambridge, the other Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So somebody should write a sort of picture book of all these places. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking of the MIT magazine because there was something using origami on PBS yeah. to yeah. Ma manufacture yes. uh, ke uh, chemicals, you know, you know, uh, medicine. To basically the structure of using the origami to show the structure of the protein that binds the molecule so you know where the left elbow is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, because he, this guy was, he was an MIT professor. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some of the stuff you guys work on there, it's amazing. You know, the application you think of ancient China's folding. The right. grain is full of a certain way, the flowers are full. It's yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and fractals. Yeah, Things exactly. like that, yeah. No, it's we deploy uh, large thin arrays in space. So you know how to fold mm -hmm. them up first. Yeah. yeah, that's really. Well, the proteins discovered it first. They can get an amazing amount of stuff in order in the middle of themselves. Yeah. Um, did Vannevar Bush have, <coughs> have, have a, a role in, in starting off? Oh, yeah, I mean Vannevar Bush is uh, the last frontier. His <coughs> book that he wrote following World War II, which basically tried to and apparently did convince the federal government that investment in blue sky research was the future of the country. And so I think that's when the National Science Foundation was formed. Mm -hmm. He was involved with that. But he, but he was, what I'm getting at is not that, which is relevant 
But he was an MIT oh, yeah. engineering professor. Both before and after. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was wondering whether internally uh, the, it, the, at the time, that was before intellectual property was started to be used as a, as a major uh, route to this kind of thing. I mean, if there were occasional patents things. And also, there wasn't that much entrepreneurship going on. Uh, Dick? Yeah, I, my first introduction to patents was in the 1960s. Yeah. That was at Michigan State. Well, one of the one of the. Know about that patent. Yep. Oh, that one's. Millions of dollars. Yep. But still. Yep. So well, this going to, anyway. Um, For the well, same reason, being yeah, able to keep was, investing what in. What I was yeah. say is, the universities didn't think of it. They didn't. But what happened is that professors, at least in this case, knew that it had a specific application. Yeah. So he pushed the university to, to get a patent for it because he because he was obligated. He to could university. see right. So, but he was the one that pushed the university to get a patent, and I think that's what Wisconsin, Stanford did. So Stanford was going for that. Yeah, Stanford. That, that in MIT, fact, you guys MIT's uh, actually the Stanford part is very interesting. Uh, in the early 1980s, so this was after the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act. Right. And remember, both Stanford and MIT and some others had an early start, but some of them took advantage of it and some of them didn't. MIT didn't very much and Stanford did. So by about the early 80s, uh, Stanford was going whiz-bang on patents and startups alike. And MIT's patent licensing office, let me tell you, was a black hole. I mean, you couldn't get your phone calls answered. I know, because I was in industry and trying to do business with them. Uh, you couldn't get your phone calls answered. You, nothing happened. And anything you tried to do with them was, took forever. So in 1985, a new vice president of research, Ken Smith, does he live in Lexington? He might. Uh, decided to fix things, and he invited the then director of Stanford's office to come for a year, for a sabbatical year. Niels Reimer. Niels, Niels Reimer, yeah. Niels Reimer. Uh, to come for a sabbatical year and then and sort of redo <coughs> MIT's office from primarily a legal office to a technology office. And he Two of us were hired, I wasn't director at the time, in March of 86, and Nils went home, and thank God. Uh, <laughs> very competent, but very rigid Scandinavian. <laughs> uh, he went home to Stanford, and we went from there. The, the counter story is that Iowa State and, yeah. and George Vincent at the Nassau. I don't know that one. Well, this is, he had built what was essentially a digital computer, the first uh -huh. actual digital computer. Uh -huh. Ultimately, after many long lawsuits, he was designated the inventor. He had filed the patent. No. He went off, war started, he went off to work at the Naval Research Lab, understanding that the university was going to file a patent. And didn't. And didn't. Ooh. So that when Eckerly and Malcolm, Malcolm and Eckerly, started their effort, they were trying to patent it. But they couldn't because it was prior art, prior art and he brought it to their attention. Well, the the RCA brought it to RCA. Well, the, one of the major changes, and I think it was the <clears throat> early 80s, but Dick can correct me. There was a time in the late 60s and throughout the 70s when Philosophically, the courts were against patents. So, and particularly in certain regions of the United States, because at that point, if you you had to do your court and uh, your patent thing, and if you didn't like it, you had to appeal it. But it was in regions, and in some regions, no patent ever survived if it was having a fact. So, but in other 
regions, they were nice to patents. And you had a halfway decent that if you got in a fight about it, your patent would survive. But in some regions, this sense of anti-monopolism uh, ruled. So in early 80s, I think it was, when was the US Circuit Court of Appeals founded? Oh, when was that formed? Yeah. Ooh. I think it was early 80s. 70s or 80s, yes. Yeah. That changed everything. A patent was, if you got in a fight with it, you probably were going to lose your patent other than be able to defend yeah, it, it against an yeah, infringer. The purpose of that was to, was to centralize. Centralize. Was and, and, it was, and, it, and it was, in the way it was formed in the legislation, it almost said to the courts, take patents seriously, don't kill them all. And so then patents became more uh, important. When I was in working as an engineer, the company told me ignore patents because more or less they didn't mean a whole lot back then. Yeah. Has that changed? It's changed oh, because of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. So their patents are, are truly presumed, as they were supposed to be, presumed valid until proven otherwise. That's a million dollar business. Many million dollar business. Oh, a billion dollar so business. It's way yeah, yeah. So, uh, at the period of time that I was active, uh, you had to decide whether you wanted to, uh, to educate the, the competition. Right, or keep it as a trade that. secret. Or whether you just wanted to keep the doors locked and not let anybody know what you were doing. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, well, that's that still, still true in... It's a decision depending on whether your invention happened, whether the practice of your invention could not be seen from the product but happened back in manufacturing. Because if somebody could take your product and just duplicate it, then trade secrets don't help you. If the magic sauce was used before the product reached the light of day, then the patent was useful. Uh, in software, well, patenting software is a volume unto itself that I'm not qualified to read. And it, right, it, it varies by the week, depending on this latest Supreme Court thing. But let's assume you're in the days when algorithms were patentable, more or less. Many software companies just kept it as a trade secret, didn't let the source code out, uh, on the grounds that by the time the patent issued, probably the software may have been obsolete, but in any case, I didn't have to teach somebody how to do it. So, uh, and so that is still going on, but to keep something as a trade secret, you really, and defend it if it leaks out, you have to take a lot, of, so there's two ways of looking at it. If they can't discover it, that's the best way to do it. If they can, if it leaks out, you can't sue. Uh, Unless somebody uh, did it on purpose and today, knew it was a trade the, secret. Uh, advance in technology in reverse engineering exactly. is pretty sophisticated. That's the problem. It's like people saying that the Coke uh, recipe is secret. Once they invented chromatography, it wasn't secret anymore. Well, in theory, it says it is. And I'm told that if you visit I think you told the story that it's still locked up. Yeah. Still locked up. Yeah. Well, but it's a, it's a, it's an advertising ploy. The locks are an advertising well, ploy. I'm not convinced that it's out there. Sure, you did a chromatography on it, and you do all kinds of analyses on Coca-Cola. Well, I'm still not convinced because nobody's gotten the product out there that tastes like Coca-Cola to me. That's right. Well, the, the, but then Coke for a while decided that it ought to taste like Pepsi, and that was a disaster. <laughs> yes, sir. There's an opposite strategy yeah. that IBM has employed, and maybe others, and that is if you don't want to make a patent, so take something to a patent. 
you see to it that it's published. And <clears throat> so, and IBM has a, has a journal that is basically devoted to publishing articles on its, on its inventions that, I forget the name of it. Well, it's a very good point that you're making because very often I hear someone's filed a patent and I say, why? Because you know it's not one you're going to be able to license. Oh, to keep someone else from doing it and locking us out of it. I said, you don't have to spend all the money on people like him. Well, you can, you can just put it up on your website. Or, or you can file what's called a defensive patent. Yeah, but you don't even have to do that nowadays. Put it on, put it on your, on your yes. Facebook. Article. You, you don't even have to, patent? it doesn't have to get go through peer review oh, or do anything. Put it on your website. And so it's really, I still hear it, and I still hear people defending it. And I say, look, if what you want is a nice little ribbon from the patent office, well, go spend your money and get the, patent, the ribbon, but you're not well, going to do anything with it. done is for business purposes, because of competition from somebody that might take it and, and do something with it. <laughs> Yeah, but if, if you're not, not if you're doing it only to keep the other guy from keeping you out of it, that's ridiculous, which is what you hear a lot nice. of. It looks nice on the tenure. Yeah, it know. looks great. And you, and you, you it used to be pretty little red ribbons, but yeah. now you showed it me changed, the picture. Yeah, changed, Those are gaudy. It changed with the, and, and with the 10 million for yeah, But the change, the, the change in the law, yeah. which allowed, was, allows first to patent, yeah. as, first, as opposed to first to invent means you really want to disclose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Disclose. Don't fight it. Yeah. Just, yeah, put it up there. Okay. Now, if they do it. Well, there's all, it, always, lawyers, lawyers can always find an argument. That's, that's the game. For, okay. For lesser, not the big stuff, but for lesser one, sometimes it's a good defensive move to, uh, you get a patent number just to discourage competition. Well, the reason for the defensive patent is so somebody else can get a patent number. And you have to pay them one. That's the reason for the defensive patent. And that's why I rather, said for that public one, public if that's the public only public. reason you're using it, publish it. Well, but Good. if somebody else gets it, or... or it, no, but if you know. published it first, they can't get it. Yes, but if they're... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. no. If they do it within a year. No, not if it's pop, not if, not, mm -hmm. not if it's, there's prior art. They might keep the whole for a manufacturing. You'll fly the pattern. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Whatever. Okay. I'll leave that to the patent attorneys to worry about. <laughs>